So I'm going to begin with a statement. As the gospel frees, renews, and transforms us internally, it also flows out of us to bring renewal in our relationships. That a gospel-centered life is not just about me. I understand the sort of picture we've been drawing where there's a me walking in my faith towards God and I grow in my awareness of my own uh, awareness of God's holiness and awareness of my sin and I realize that the gap between my performance and God's expectations is huge and Jesus says I, I will declare you to be holy I will connect you and as I grow to understand my faith the cross gets bigger as I realize how much I sin and how far I am from a God, and He still forgives me and makes. I understand what He did for me, what Jesus has accomplished. The gospel centered thinking is to realize that, but it's not just about me. When I acknowledge sin and I focus on uh, what God has done for me, the next step is it, it's not just about what happens inside of me, but this relationship moves me to include other people in that. If I have this relationship with God by faith in Jesus, and the cross means this to me, and he says, I will forgive you, I want other people to have that freedom and forgiveness that's mine. But relationships with people is precisely where gospel-centered living is, is most difficult. I get God, because I trust him. But working it out with you, well, sometimes that's a different story. You get two sinful people together and, and my self-centeredness bumps into your self-centeredness and my opinions bump into your opinions and your perception is colored by your own experiences and your own traumatic moments and, and your personality and, and your emotions. You get colored by the way you were shaped and raised. And so you see the world and perceive the world differently than me. And me and my is different than you and yours. And there are conflicts and disagreements and hurt feelings. And so books are written about conflict resolution. And there are all kinds of classes and training. There are people who get degrees in sort of how to resolve conflict, conflict resolution skills. There are professionals who are reconcilers or are peacemakers or negotiators. And we learn and study those skills to be good at conflict management. So there's no way I can adequately address all those topics in a 20-minute sermon. And I also find it a bit challenging or humorous or ironic or maybe just lousy timing that this is the topic I'm supposed to talk about uh, the Sunday before this particular election. Because the country seems to be divided. And every disagreement seems to turn into a serious offense. And the intensity of those feelings seems to be magnified lately. So there are literally friends who aren't talking to each other and parents and kids who don't speak to each other and people are angry and frustrated and the verbal attacks have almost become normal to us. And the stage is set for, for violent reactions so we're all a little bit cautious or anxious about what's going to happen this coming week. And I don't know about you, but I'm sick and tired of the attack ads. Amen? A couple days and we'll be done. And thank God that we're finally through that period of life. And we can look at those people and think, man, how... But I wonder about your attack ads. Like the personal ones. The little digs you put against people at work. Or the way you're sort of building an alliance against somebody uh, who said this or did that. I wonder rather than those attack ad people, I'm so glad they're going to be done. What about you? And the way that you attack other people and tear them down and the things that you say that hurt and destroy. See, it's easy to talk about conflict when it's somebody else, but today we want to bring it down to this more personal place of our own life, and how do we live a, a gospel-centered way of resolving conflict? Because we get pretty self-protective. Now I'm exhausted. And conflict does that. It wears us out. And somewhere along the way, we get stupid. Because there's this part that happens when there's a conflict, and then I just see you coming in the room, and I sort of have this reaction, and it's literally a biophysical, metaphysical reaction. Not metaphysical, biophysical reaction. Physiological, that's the word. A physiological reaction inside of me. You step in the room, and the hair on the back of my head gets on end. You know those people? And you sort of feel yourself tensing up when a person walks in the room, 
And already they walk in the room and fight or flight kicks in and get adrenaline pumps. And then what happens? Your muscles tense up. You're ready. You're ready to attack. You're ready to defend. And what happens then is your blood goes to your muscles everywhere else. It's not in your head. And literally you get stupid. And all of a sudden, you're not thinking clearly, and you say and you do things that you might not normally do because you're ready, you're geared up for a fight. And yet lately, there are serious issues that are being discussed and debated. And, and last week, we read the story about people who gather around themselves, people who say what they want to hear. It used this phrase, that the Bible phrase was, people gather around them, people that have what their itching ears want to hear. We just get people to tell us, and so we build our little alliances of people who agree with us and say the same thing so we can attack the other people because they're different and we're sort of building alliances and fighting and the conflict seems to grow and we pick sides and we attack the other people and, and we're in this crazy time where that seems to be normal. So one of my personal concerns as your pastor is that we seem to be latching on to, to little truths. And we sort of find someone that will agree with our little truth. But it's not necessarily the whole truth. It's not the whole picture. You're not wrong. You're just not seeing the whole picture. And one of the keys to resolving conflict is actually to figure out what's actually true. I just want Walter Cronkite to come back and tell me this is the truth. I remember Ross Perot with little charts and diagrams. I want, I want Ross, come, give me the charts and diagrams and tell me what the truth is. I'll deal with it. But now I don't know what the truth is. It's a nuanced thing. Every old... And so we're in this place dealing with conflict and tension and not even knowing exactly where to stand and what the truth might actually be. And conflicts are inevitable in the sinful world. And so we have to figure out what's, what's the gospel-centered approach to resolving conflict. So this morning I want to bring it down just personal to you and me. Can you think of the most recent fight you had? Maybe it was with your spouse or your kid or a coworker. Who was right and who was wrong? Well, obviously you were right. And stop for a moment and think about your actions and your reactions during the time of conflict. Because in this Bible study, the gospel-centered life, it talks about your behavior probably falls into one of two categories. You kind of lean one way or the other. I call it skunks and turtles. And you mess with a skunk, the whole world stinks. You mess with a turtle, it crawls into its shell. That describes that we tend to have one or two reactions. We tend to either be attackers or withdrawers. Now, attackers, if that's sort of more like you, you like to be on the offensive. You place a high priority and value on justice. And so matters are greatly important to you about who's right and who's wrong. Here's some of the signs you might be an attacker. You deal with anger or frustration by venting it. Everybody knows. They can hear you. You argue your case passionately. You ask questions like, how do you know that? And can you prove that? You want to fight until the fight is over or somebody wins and somebody loses. You cross-examine like a lawyer in order to get to the heart of the facts. You have kids like that? When you're a parent... You know, they, got to, they know how to fight and argue and they make their case and they, and they probably learned that from you. And winning the argument is more important than loving the person. And you usually find a way to turn argument to focus on the other person. If that describes you, you may be on that side. Some people tend to be more withdrawers, more the turtle type. With these people, the tendency is often to be more defensive. And they do whatever they can to avoid a conflict or a fight. If you're a withdrawer, maybe these are some of the patterns you can recognize in yourself. You deal with anger or frustration by holding it in or suppressing it. You have opinions, but you keep them to yourself because you don't want to cause a fight. You want to keep the peace. You ask questions like, do we have to talk about this now? Or is this really necessary? You'd rather avoid a fight than win one. And you sometimes literally physically leave in order to gain space to avoid the fight. Now the fact is, whether you're one or the other or tend to lean one way or the other, these are called normal, natural responses. And they may be natural and normal, but they're not necessarily biblical and not necessarily gospel-centered. 
So I learned from the story about Paul and Peter in Galatians chapter 2, a little setting. Uh, the church had begun to grow, and Peter's with a group of people. And there are Jews and Gentiles there. He's been eating dinner, but from Jerusalem comes this group of Judaizers. There are Christians who believe that they started off Jewish. If you want to be a Christian, you have to sort of become Jewish first. Practice all the Jewish laws and rites. Things like uh, circumcision and the kind of food that you eat. I mean, imagine that as an evangelism tool in a Gentile world. Hey, come on, join my church and get circumcised. That didn't necessarily go well with all the Gentile people. But for Peter, it was the issue of food and eating. And so as Peter's there, he'd been hanging out with these Gentile people, but all of a sudden when these Judaizers came, he sort of separated himself from them because they were not eating properly like a Jewish person would. And Paul's watching this and saying, this is, this is an issue of the gospel. This is going to divide this church. And all of a sudden where Peter at one point, the leader of the church was sort of inclusive of people, all of a sudden there's a separation and there's some distance and Peter's causing this division. So Paul realizes he's got to speak up. He's got to say something. He can't just ignore it and withdraw from the situation. But he doesn't want to come in sort of as the hammer and sort of pound him and say, Peter, you're all wrong. So how does, how does Paul jump into the conversation? We can learn. When Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. Sometimes the Bible says the first thing you do is you go to the person themselves. That's normally the first step. In this case, it was such a public thing that Paul said, I have to address this in front of everybody so everybody hears this conversation. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. But when they came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? And here's some things you learn from this little interaction. First, Paul approached Peter directly. He didn't build an alliance, didn't get a group of people behind him to say, hey, we're going to get Paul, didn't say, we have a group that says, Paul, you're wrong. He just went face to face and said, Peter, what you're doing is not consistent with the gospel that we proclaim. And the second thing is, his motivation wasn't to, to prove Peter wrong or to gain a following or to divide the church. His purpose was to make sure that, that Peter understood. He was there to defend the gospel. He's there to say, do you understand, Peter, what's going on here? Because you say you have a relationship with God and so these people, but what you're doing is turning away from this and sort of joining a group of people and it's causing a division. It's leading you away from this relationship with God and his purpose, his motivation was to resolve the conflict and bring Peter back. And third, Paul asked a question and wanted Peter to give a response. He wanted him to think about let me ask you a question that helps you think about where the problem is. I call it the art of Christian conversation. So we have this sense in America that I'm not the judge. I'm not supposed to judge anybody. But here's the challenge with that. If I love and care about you, and I see you have a relationship with God, but you start walking away, and I do nothing, how does that demonstrate my love and care for you? But if I see you have a relationship with Jesus, and you begin to get in the dirty water, you begin to do things or say things that are taking away. At some point, I'm not the judge. I'm going to say, wait a second, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about you making these choices and treating people this way and talking like that that doesn't seem consistent with the faith that we say we have. I'm not the judge, God is, because I've got my own stuff. Whenever I go to somebody and, and accuse them or point out a fault and I create a conflict, then it's always that me against you, in my opinion. And, and I want to start out with this humble place. Look, I, I have my own sinful stuff, and I want you to hold me accountable when you see me running away from my relationship with Jesus. But right now, i got to talk to you about this, because I see what you're saying and doing is doing damage and, and hurting, and, and damaging your relationship with God, and damaging, in this situation, the church. And, and I care about you. And then ask good questions. Sort of that moment you say to somebody, look, 
this is what I'm seeing. This is what I'm hearing. Am I right? Great question. I hear you saying this, and it sounds like that to me. Am I missing something, or is that, is that true? I hear you're doing this now, and, and this is what it looks like to me. Am I missing something, or is that right? Ask them. I, I see this. I hear this. It sounds like that. Am I right, or am I missing something? And the second thing, you say this, and God says that. How do you put that together? Here's what I hear you saying and what you're doing and describing how you're behaving. Here's what God calls us to be, and they're not the same. This is you, this is that. How do you put that together? And it's asking you a question in the middle of the conflict to say, I want you to wrestle with how you live out this faith. How do you keep your relationship with Jesus strong as you're listening, as you're living? The verse we read in the New Testament was about being a reconciler, uh, uh, to be at peace, to be one. That said, uh, forgiveness isn't done until the relationship is one. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. And all this is from God, who reconciled the world to himself. He says, I, I will take the sin away. I will connect my holiness and your performance. Jesus will be the cross, the connection together. I will reconcile, I will bring you back together. We have a relationship that sin cannot destroy. That God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting men's sins against them. And he's committed to us this message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors as though God was making his appeal, his reconciling conflict resolution skills through us. The key is to help people think about their relationship with God. And I've been thinking about that phrase where God says he's not counting our sins against us. And he has every right to. So whose sins are you holding against them these days? Where's the relationship been so broken and tense that you look at that person, we're not reconciled, we're in conflict? Maybe it's a lie that was told. Maybe it was something somebody did that hurt you or hurt somebody that you love. Maybe it's opinion that they hold that's so far from yours you just don't get it. What sins are you holding against that person that are keeping the conflict alive? Remember the sermon about forgiveness? It talked about how God took the initiative to heal the relationship with us. God reconciled us to himself. So I'm talking about, about some principles about how do we avoid conflict and restore the relationship. And the first one, number one, is this. Talk to God before talking to the person. Before I'm going to talk to you and try and resolve a conflict, I'm going to make sure that my relationship with God is on, on that side, that, that I have this relationship with Jesus inside of me, and my motives are not to attack or hurt, my motives are right, to sort of make sure your relationship with God is okay. I'm going to make sure before I talk to you that my motives and my perspective is, is clear. First thing I'm going to do is pray and talk to God. Second thing is, Take the initiative. Talk about that in the story. God was reconciling the world to himself. He came in the form of Jesus to forgive our sins. God took action to make sure nothing would separate us. So the second thing is, take the initiative. Be the one that says, I'm going to come to try to resolve the conflict and heal what's broken. Number one, talk to God before talking to the person. Number two, take the initiative. And number three, sympathize with the feelings of the other person. Try to you know, jump into their shoes and see how they see it from their perspective because we all come from different places and have different backgrounds and I want to understand how do you see this and how do you feel about this? And focus on feelings more than facts. When people are upset, sometimes they're irrational, but they have some deep feeling that's been broken or hurt and they're coming from that place. So not just the issue, but what are they feeling? Try to empathize and simply understand what in the world has got you so angry and so hurt that we're in conflict. So listen, the cliche is true, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. So start off with this idea that I'm going to come into this conflict to listen and understand where you're coming from and how you're feeling about this. Number four, own and confess your part of the conflict. You know, the gospel lesson was that story that we heard. You know, before you take a speck out of somebody else's eye, take the log out of your own eye. 
So when I come into the conflict, I want to own the part of it that I messed up, the things that I've said. I know where I stand and what I've done. I think this is what I've done to hurt you. And ask, is, is this it? If I, is this what I've done? Is this what you've heard? Or is it something else you're upset about? Own the part that you commit. So number one, talk to God before talking to the person. Number two, take the initiative. Number three, try to understand and sympathize with their feelings. Number four, own the part that is yours. And number five, uh, attack the problem, not the person. We live in a world where sort of attack speech has become the way that we talk to each other, but what if the idea is I'm going to attack the issue, the problem, the disagreement. Let's talk about that, not attack you, but this is the issue. This is what we're going to try and figure out and sort through together. Talk about the issue, not the person. Number six, Cooperate as much as possible. That verse that says, do everything possible on your part to live at peace with everyone. What if I approach this saying, I'm here to try to listen, to try to understand, to negotiate, to listen, to compromise. Is there a place where we can agree to meet or agree to disagree, but we're going to try and cooperate at coming to a solution, some way to resolve what's broken between us. We may end up with very different opinions, but we don't have to destroy each other in the process. Talk to God before talking to the other person. Take the initiative. Sympathize with the other persons and try and understand their feelings. Own the parts that you can do. Confess those parts. You're part of the conflict. Attack the problem, not the person. Cooperate as much as possible. Negotiate. And number seven, emphasize reconciliation, not just resolution. Reconciliation has to do with fixing the relationship. Resolution has to do with solving the problem. So I'm sitting in my office, actually in the bedroom with a little desk I got set up in the back of the house, with, working on my sermon and trying to think what I'm going to say, and Charlie comes in. He says, you working on your sermon? I said, yeah, he's nine. So well, can I help you? Sure. So he goes into his room and he comes back with a VBS CD. He says, you should listen to one of these songs. Maybe this will sort of help you come up with an idea. So, so I said, well, well, what's your favorite one? And he says, well, this one, Oh, Happy Day. Oh, happy day. Oh, happy day. When Jesus washed, when Jesus washed, when Jesus washed, when Jesus washed, he washed my sins away. And it got me. All this talk about conflict and resolving conflict and living a gospel-centered life with the focus on the cross gets down to one incredible moment. I have a God who so desperately loves me, he sent his son to die for me to guarantee that the relationship I have with God would not be destroyed. I couldn't ruin it. He guaranteed his love for me. And if that's where my heart is with God, I want you to have that. I want the same love and relationship I have with God to be the same relationship you have with God. I I get this forgiveness I get to live in. I get this grace of God I get to know. I want you to have the same relationship with Jesus that I do. I want to find a way to resolve this conflict. To share with you the same love and forgiveness that God has shared with me. You know, we gather around the altar for communion. All look kind of sit in our seats now, but and the same Jesus who says to me, I died to set you free, your sins are forgiven, says to you, I died to set you free, your sins are forgiven. That we share in this, this forgiveness, this reconciled relationship to God. So we ought to be working at forgiving each other and resolving those tensions and conflicts however we possibly can. So that other people have this song in their head. There's a happy day when the God of the universe said to me I will love and I will forgive you and what if our church became known for that that this is a place where people listen and where people work to resolve what's broken this is a place where forgiveness happens This is a place where relationships get addressed and we try as best we can to bring a sense of oneness and forgiveness. 
What if we became known as a place on the planet where people loved each other and forgave each other and worked to resolve that so there was worship that says, man, what a happy day that we have Jesus who forgives us. And I still live and dream for that day. Amen?